Kuiper tribesmen seize police firearms and vehicle. Southern Highlands leaders, including Prime Minister, say sorry. And review of Kokoda Track Authority begins. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thank you for joining me for Sunday's news. Two police vehicles were intercepted in Nipah, Southern Highlands Province by tribesmen who disarmed the officers on board. Hela Provincial Police Commander Martin Lakari told MTV News that the officers involved were travelling back to Tari after servicing their vehicles in Mount Hagen. The incident happened 72 hours after the burning down of an Air New Guinea plane in Mendi on Thursday. This picture shared on social media shows the two police vehicles involved in the ordeal. The incident occurred just before 12 noon today at Sindom Hill in Semin village of Nipa district. Two mobile squad vehicles were seized by tribesmen who shot at police officers on board before removing their weapons. Three police issued firearms were seized. On Thursday, angry protesters set fire to an New Guinea plane in Mendi before destroying government properties, including the Mendi Courthouse. This came hours after the National Court in Port Mosby dismissed an election petition filed against current Governor William Powie. The Royal Papua New Guinea Constabulary is yet to release an official statement on this, but at the moment the number of officers who were taken as hostage is yet to be confirmed and the vehicle seized is still in Nipah. Hela Provincial Police Commander Martin Lakari is now appealing to the tribesmen involved to release both the officers and the police vehicle. Meanwhile, in a news conference this afternoon, Prime Minister Peter O'Neill was asked to comment on the incident in Nipah. This is what he had to say. Uh, uh, serious law and order issues uh, in the province. All the uh, members of each of the uh, districts uh, have their own leaders and the leaders are attending to uh, the, uh, making sure that the community is settled and, and that the province comes back to uh, normalcy very soon. Tekla Gunga, National MTV News. Two days after violence erupted in Mendi, Southern Highlands, leaders from the province met this afternoon to iron out issues and restore order in the province. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill says investigations will continue for the looting and burning of the Air New Guinea aircraft. He also made it clear that sidelined Governor William Powie and Petitioner Joseph Cobol will pursue their differences in court. At around 2.30 p.m. this afternoon, Southern Highlands leaders, including state ministers, met at Airways Auto for a closed-door meeting. Two hours later, the media was calling for a joint statement. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill apologized to the nation of the actions that transpired in Mandy. I want to extend uh, this uh, uh, expression of our, our sympathies to all Papua New Guineans that we have brought about uh, this stress to, to, to the life of our country. The Prime Minister also made known that the Southern Highlands government is suspended and Mr. Eldo will take charge. This will also include investigations into the banning of an New Guinea aircraft, court house and other state assets. NEC has got no, uh, no other supervisory powers or legislation that can uh, be able to supervise the work of the provincial government. The Emergency Committee of Parliament uh, will immediately reconvene and they will send a team to Southern Highlands to assess the situation on uh, the administration and the uh, uh, rule of law and order uh, in the province. We all agree, all the leaders agree that we must support their work and let them uh, conclude that so that they can report back to parliament and of course parliament will make the uh, necessary decisions. With incumbent Governor William Powie and Petitioner Joseph Cobol present, the Prime Minister says the dispute concerning the election petition case will be referred to the courts. Agreed that uh, they will pursue their differences and they will pursue it through the uh, courts uh, so that uh, the courts can make a determination of the uh, differences that they have uh, as a result of the elections in Southern Ireland's original seat. I want to thank uh, the other candidates, especially Joe Coppol and Pastor Bennett, and of course Governor for uh, reaching this uh, understanding. Jack Lepave, Jr., National 
MTV News. Meanwhile, petitioner Joseph Cobol says he will pursue the election petition case in the higher courts. Mr. Cobol says that matter will return in court in order for justice to be served. Mr. Cobol also apologized to New Guinea and the country for the violence that erupted in Mendi last Thursday. He was up in Mendi in the rush to the airport and in one corner and it was uncalled for, but the just accident happened and they burned the plane down and uh, which I condemned the action by the people, supporters, opportunities, then thoroughly uncalled for. On behalf of my 24 candidates and the other people of Southern Highlands and Peace throughout Papua New Guinea, I sincerely apologize to New Guinea for the actions that was taken by the opportunities in the Southern Highlands. I have now prepared to review the court case to the Supreme Court and we have now a court case pending with this Pastor Bennett's petition on the same issue. We are still addressing this and we have our own interest to pursue the court case and law and order problem opportunities in that province should have to settle their mind and keep calm until this appeal period goes over. The Catholic Bishops' Conference has condemned the actions of the supporters of losing candidates who set fire to the Air New Guinea aircraft public buildings in Mendi. CBC is calling on the government to bring those people, including the leaders, to justice. CBC says the people have not only damaged public property, but also irreparably damaged the image and dignity of the country. General Secretary Father Victor Roche says we have given wrong signals to the participants of APAC. He stressed that there is a need for evaluation on the election process and the results. You're with National MTV News. Stay tuned for more coming up after the break. Welcome back to the news. Turning overseas, outrage continues to grow over the U.S. government's policy of separating families at the Mexican border. About 200 children have been put into special camps after their parents were arrested in a six-week crackdown on illegal immigrants. Tonight, an all-out battle brewing over the controversial policy of separating parents who illegally cross the border from their children. The president tweeting today, Democrats can fix their forced family breakup at the border by working with Republicans on new legislation for a change. The president doubling down after calling out Democrats in an unprecedented press conference on the White House lawn. Mr. President, do you agree with uh, children being taken away from No, I hate it. I hate the children being taken away. The Democrats have to change their law. That's their law. But that's not true. It's not a Democrat passed law. It's the Trump administration's enforcement of a zero tolerance policy announced last month. I have put in place a zero tolerance policy. Tonight, nearly 2,000 children have been separated at the U.S.-Mexico border from their parents. The president now suggesting he'll relax his policy if he gets concessions on immigration, like his border wall. Now, we're going to have a real border. We're going to have a real wall. Mexico's going to pay for it. The Democrats can come to us as they actually are. In all fairness, we are talking to them. And they can change the whole border security. We need a wall. We need border security. The president catching heat on social media. Former CIA director Michael Hayden, a Trump critic, tweeting this picture of what looks like a Nazi concentration camp, writing... Other governments have separated mothers and children. Democrats accusing Trump of playing politics. The president is throwing red meat to his base when he does that. He's using children for a political purpose. It's shameful. Cup football fans have been caught in an incident in Moscow involving a taxi plowing onto a crowded sidewalk. The speeding taxi was caught on camera, accelerating to a crowd of tourists, injuring eight people. 
It came all of a sudden and out of nowhere. A taxi in central Moscow violently and suddenly veers onto the sidewalk straight into a crowd. Enraged bystanders force open the door and haul the driver out of his vehicle, but he seizes a chance to escape and bolts. Security camera footage capturing the scene in an area popular with tourists just several hundred meters away from the Kremlin. Eight people, including two from Mexico, sought medical attention after the collision. Russian state news reporting the driver told police he fell asleep sleep at the wheel with his foot on the gas pedal. Moscow police are drawing criminal charges for the driver and are describing it as an accident. More than one million foreigners are expected to travel to Russia this month for the World Cup. This incident comes amid heightened security and a State Department warning that Americans going to the Games should reconsider travel there due to a threat of terrorism. In the U.S., there is some a tool with a difference. It's a tool for change, to change complacency about gun violence, to change laws that many say contribute to rising death toll, and to change the course of history. I say, how y'all doing, Chicago? <laughs> Bringing their brand of activism and all the crowds and cameras that come with it to the south side of Chicago. Everyone from Parkland is so grateful to be here with you today. We're so grateful to fight with you, stand with you, rally with you. Announced earlier this month back in Florida, the students from Parkland officially kicked off their next movement, a 75-stop cross-country political action summer tour and voter registration drive. We're calling this the road to change. What place better to bring change to than Chicago. Linking up with young Chicago activists like Trevon Bosley and Ariana Williams, who will join them on the summer tour. The Parkland teens taking a bit of a back seat at the first summer stop, the Chicago Strong Rally and St. Sabina Academy Peace March. Instead, choosing to shine their spotlight on the Windy City's youth movements, which have struggled to garner the same kind of attention. I've been fighting for anti-violence for probably eight or nine years now, and we did a media, we did a press conference, and we literally had no press at all. And to see that Parkland got the press, and they allowed us to use their platform to spread our message of everyday shootings, because they've been happening for so long and so often, and majority of the times the media here has become content with it, as well as the community here has become content with the violence. I was born into a violent Chicago, but in reality, we're starting to change that because we begin to see if we have a hope of people helping us and we have a way to change Chicago. Manuel Oliver, whose son Joaquin was one of 17 murdered at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School, used art, paint and a hammer to advocate for nationwide gun reform as the city's young activists delivered fiery speeches. It's time for change. Taking turns on the stage with the likes of former Arizona Congresswoman and shooting survivor Gabby Giffords, Chicago teens solemnly read the 147 names of young people killed in their city this year. I'm not here to sing, man. I'm here to turn up, Joe. I'm trying to get loud. Chance the Rapper and Jennifer Hudson, the singer lost three family members to gun violence in 2008, pumped up the crowd of thousands as they took to the south side streets, marching for peace and unity in Chicago. The young people here today saying these are the first steps. You ain't seen nothing yet. On their unified road. We're coming for you. That they believe will end in change. The kids are done sitting at the kiddie table. It's now the adults' turn to sit there and we stand up. National MTV News continues with more after the break. Don't go away. Welcome back. Intergovernment Relations Minister Kevin Isifu has announced the commencement of a review on the Kokoda Track Authority this week. The review follows the announcements by the Prime Minister early this year on matters relating to KTA's governance, structure, mandate, responsibilities and accountability. The minister said his office is mandated to ensure special purpose authorities like KTA serve their purpose. There's nothing Intergovernment Relations Minister Kevin Isufu says special purpose authorities like the Kokoda Trek Authority must ensure they are relevant and serve their operations to benefit the people. To help implement the projects and manage the benefit derived from the Kokoda Trek to best serve the interests of the surrounding communities in the impacted area. 
uh, especially within the two provinces, province of Central Province and uh, um, Oro Province. While the Kokoda Trek review will go ahead, a review of Kokoda Trek initiative is also in progress under the Conservation and Environment Protection Authority. As you know, over the years we have received a lot of complaints from landowners uh, and from uh, respective uh, players in the uh, Kokoda Trek uh, Authority. Uh, with so much complaint that they want to go they want us to review the whole arrangement. The review will be led by the Department of Intergovernment Relations with a team from the Prime Minister's Department, Treasury and Planning. Minister Isufu stressed that terms and conditions for review set are aimed at finding out the issues affecting the Kokoda track over the years. Our review is to, uh, to make sure that we play our part in uh, making sure that uh, all the issues are addressed uh, from the respective uh, players. And, uh, and the landowners uh, along the uh, Kokoda Trek area. SIPA review on Kokoda Trek initiative and KTA review will be put together once completed to find a way forward. Isufu further stated that the long-term issues affecting the people along the Kokoda Trek have affected the tourism industry as well. Stacy Yalo, National MTV News. As part of the early celebrations of World Yoga Day, Port Moresby Yoga residents gather this morning to commemorate the day, which will fall on the 21st of June. The Walk for Life today concluded with a yoga ceremony with NCD Governor Poes Pakop, sharing his testimony on how yoga had saved his life. Faithful yoga followers gathered this morning in Port Moresby to commemorate World Yoga Day. NCD Governor Powers Pakop says United Nations recognizes the importance and transformative power of yoga and has declared the day to celebrate and create awareness on this ancient practice. It's a science that gives us physical, mental, emotional, spiritual balance. It enables us to harness the whole of our human potential to be greater than we are today. And it, if our people find this practice every emotional physical mental balance three quarters of the problems we face in our country will go away governor pakop told yoga followers that while people are too busy pursuing to success in life most often they forget about other needs of the body such as emotional and spiritual needs while it is important to develop certain aspect of our human potential to succeed in life it's also risky if we ignore our other potential of capabilities. This is sadly true for ordinary people and for great people alike. Pakop on the occasion shared his testimony on how yoga had saved his life and had made him a changed man. He encouraged fellow politicians and the general public to focus on the outcomes of yoga and join the because I choose to change. To learn to manage my emotion was a struggle. I was quick to anger and the stress was bad for me and my health. I had to learn to manage my emotion every day at all levels. The pressure of being a member of parliament, being a governor, a husband, a parent, it's not easy. It's not easy. The expectation placed on me are never easy, even to this day. And without emotional balance, strength of character and intelligence, it was going to be a huge challenge. Pakop stressed that to be healthy and wise, one has to be mentally strong, emotionally balanced, spiritually guided by faith in order to continue to pursue set visions and goals. Stacy Yalo, National MTV News. Ongoing exercises by the Papua New Guinea Defence Force towards security operations during the APEC summit continue. Today, members of the 1st Royal Pacific Islands Regiment conducted a drill on how to respond to riots. Known as riot control exercise, the drill is to prepare soldiers to respond to public unrest in an urban setting. 
In this drill, members of the PNGDF, who acted as angry landowners, were trying to start up a riot. But as they were approaching their target, they were met by soldiers who would prevent the riot from happening. The riot drill is one of the many exercises members of 1LPIR will be engaged in for the next two days. The other exercises include urban patrolling and vehicle checks at selected areas in NCD. For the exercises that will be conducted outside of military premises, police officers from the traffic directorate will be assisting soldiers to conduct their duties. The joint operation was announced in a media conference between the NCD command and the 1RPIR. Tekla Gunga, National MTV News. Papua New Guinea Cancer Foundation, in partnership with ExxonMobil PNG, conducted the sixth Healthy Teen School program at Poribada Primary School, Central Province, recently. This partnership on the importance of cancer prevention has reached more primary schools this year. Each workshop focuses on the importance of making healthy lifestyle choices today to reduce the risk of developing certain types of cancer in the future. The Healthy Teens Workshop was conducted by health educator Mr. Jacob Oburi. The renewed sponsorship with ExxonMobil PNG will allow PNGCF to conduct similar programs in various schools in the country. Chukai Sports is next. Don't go away. Sports. Welcome to Chukai Sports to the FIFA World Cup now and last night's Paul C opener mat played into France's favour, Australia losing 2-1. And it was the video assistant referee that became the much talked about aid for this French win. Looking to work. This match saw a goalless first half with both the Frenchmen and the Socceroos making attacks that were cut short. Into the area, problems for the Australians here. The first save of the match is made by Ryan. The ball is spread. The first opportunity the uh, Aussies have got here. It's but it was the second half that came with controversial penalties endorsed by the VAR. France was the first to make the mark on the scoreline thanks to a pass from Paul Pogba to Antoine Griezmann that was challenged by soccer with Joshua Riesland that sent Griezmann down. Well, he, got the, he did get a toe on the ball there before Griezmann went down. The ref indicated play on but it was 30 seconds later that the VAR would reverse that decision awarding France a penalty kick that brought them the first goal. Griezmann's never scored in a World Cup Finals. He has now! Minutes later, Australia made use of a penalty kick also to level the score line. Versus Loris. Yerina keeps his goal! France responded with eight minutes to spare through Paul Pogba's long shot, which hit the crossbar and landed over the line in goal, putting them in the lead with two points to one. And uh, it's over the line, is it? Well, that could be one for the... Yes, it is over. They look to make another substitution of their own and to introduce their own young striker, Daniel Azani. There's the goal line technology. There is the proof you wanted if it was necessary. The remaining eight minutes turned dreadful for the Socceroos in their attempt to turn the match around. Uh, I think he's certainly going to get a free kick and a yellow card against him. And uh, Beich. Australia will meet Denmark on Thursday, while France will go up against Peru on Friday. Dinero <laughs> Sraiko National MTV Sports. While France is thankful for the video assistant referee that aided their win, Argentina despises the fact that it denied them Lionel Messi's attempt at a match-winning goal. This was during their first match in Pool D against Iceland last night. For Iceland, this is a very strong performance for a first-ever match at the World Cup. Still on the FIFA World Cup, the second Pool C match was one that left not only Peruvian fans but football followers across the world stunned. While Peru was thankful, the video assistant referee reversed the ref's decision 
And it was unforgivable penalty blunder at the 45th minute that gave the game to Denmark. With Colombia versus Japan. The first half saw no change on the scoreboard as Denmark eyed a goal mark. Looking for a route to goal, can't find it. Peruvian shirts. Peru's first scoring opportunity came in the last minute of the first half when they were awarded a penalty following a foul committed by Denmark. Bakary Kasama, wave play on. But then. Unfortunately, Christian Cuevas off the mark goal attempt was Peru's missed goal, giving Denmark room for a win in the second half. Thousands of Peru fans, if it hits the net, it was far from hitting the net. Going into the second half, Denmark made their mark 15 minutes in, recording the first and the only goal for that match. Peru onside is Paulsen. The remaining 30 minutes of that match was one the Peruvians never recovered in time as full time dawned on them. Peru now looks to make their next game on Thursday against France Count. Just wide from Guerrero. Dinero Strico National MTV Sports. In Trukai Sports coming up next, more from Russia as the game of soccer is taken to the swamps. Stay tuned for details. True Kai Sports. Welcome back to True Kai Sports. With the FIFA World Cup underway, soccer-loving Russians are getting dirty playing the beautiful game. In the northern Leningrad region, mud-caked footballers have spurned conventional pitches and are playing in knee-deep swamps, leaving them exhausted, filthy and laughing. The bizarre and dirty sport saw competitors face off in the village of Porgy on Saturday for a championship that would see one team out of nine crowned Supreme Swamp Soccer Stars. Swamp soccer originates from Finland and is used to train athletes for cross-country skiing. But the sport is fast gaining popularity and drawing enthusiasts looking for some dirty fun. The players in this small village were seen moving through mud for what was usually momentary contact with an official FIFA World Cup ball in a bid to advance their team. Anatoly Sergeyev, who organizes tournaments in the Russian village, says Swamp Soccer fans will show their passion for the sport on the stands of the World Cup stadiums. He added this version of the sport is great for getting emotions out. But fellow player Sergei Strika, known to his competitors as just the beard, says the game has benefits other than physical health. This is the best exfoliation in the swamp. It is even better than exfoliation procedures done in Thailand with fish. It is the best exfoliation. After this, the hills become as pink as a piglet's bottom. Swamp soccer tournaments have been held across the globe in countries such as Brazil, the Netherlands and China. Sergeyev and the Beard say no training is required to play this strenuous game, just strong willpower and a huge sense of fun. Still in the World Cup, meerkats at a British zoo have continued their series of World Cup predictions, this time forecasting a win for England over Tunisia in their opening Pool G match on Tuesday. The Mystic Meerkats at Drayton Manor Theme Park and Zoo near Tamworth in Staffordshire have successfully predicted the results of sporting tournaments in the past. Last week, correctly identifying Russia as the future winners of the tournament's opening match against Saudi Arabia. This proved true with the host nation eventually romping to a 5-0 win over Saudi Arabia on Friday. Meanwhile, in Germany, a psychic elephant had bad news for German football fans on Friday. Zella the Elephant predicted that Die Mannschaft would be knocked out of the Soccer World Cup in the early rounds. By picking a ball out of a basket with her trunk, Zella predicted two draws in Germany's opening matches, followed by a defeat in their third match against South Korea. But Stuttgart Zoo director Thomas Kolpin had reassuring words saying that her predictions for the European Championship were much more successful in the later rounds. 
If that's true, World Cup fans can expect a shock result with Senegal to be crowned champion on July 15. Corbin says that's a real underdog tip. She's not looking at the favourites, but more at the betting odds. However, optimistic German fans might prefer to listen to Nanuk, the baby polar bear, who lives in the western German city of Gelsenkirchen. She showed a preference for a cardboard box full of fish marked with the German flag. As for the Mexicans, their box was ripped apart only a little bit, but one could interpret that as showing that Germany just may defeat Mexico. World Cup fever has reached a fever pitch in Mexico as fans of the national team are praying to a small figure of Jesus dressed in the Mexican national soccer uniform in the hope that their team wins big. So whether or not the German psychic animal's predictions are spot on, the Mexicans will be hanging on to their prayers. As for the rest of the world, we'll have to wait and see come match day. The two teams will go head to head in the early hours of Monday at 1 a.m. and MTV will bring that to you live and free. To rugby union star All Blacks, Bowden Barrett is unlikely to play in the third test against France next weekend in Dunedin. Barrett failed the concussion test after falling heavily, attempting to take a high ball in that All Blacks win last night in Wellington. Travel day today for the All Blacks, with more than enough to mull over for the third test, including replacing Bowden Barrett. There's no point uh, putting him under extra pressure of the travel when he can stay at home and rest and um, come down tomorrow or, or not come down at all. 24 hours hasn't helped quell all the debate over the early red card to French fullback Benjamin Fowl for taking out Barrett. Players landed on his head, I've got no other option, it's a red card. It's not really intentional, it's, it's like it's a challenge and he's got it wrong and referees had to red card him because that's what the rules say. Steve Hansen believes rugby needs to look at a report system like in league if the incident doesn't involve foul play. It's spoiling test matches red cards. On the other hand, world rugby is adamant players need protection. Yeah, it's a tough one because you don't want to take that part of the game um, out of it because that's a big part of um, rugby is, is that contest. Bowden Barrett's head was the initial worry. Overall, the concern, the All Blacks at times sloppy display, where they took time to adjust to playing against 14 men. Leonard Brown, he's got Jordy Barrett. All of a sudden you start having expectations that there's a lot of space there and you start rushing to try and get to it. Just not trying to panic, I guess, as well, just, just playing a nice calm game. The All Blacks did end up scoring four tries to one and used some well-crafted moves and individual skill, but were often outgunned up front, with some of the forwards struggling mentally to lift again after Eden Park. The more I think about it, the more we probably did stuff that up, you know. Uh, you're asking guys who haven't played for a long time to come back and then double up and they're still not getting over the first one. Hanson says there's certainly no panic, just lessons. Another June series in the bag, 26-13 but with plenty to focus on, almost a coach's dream. And the Irish were the other big winners, beating Wallabies in Australia for the first time in nearly 40 years to retain the second place in the world ranking. A revamped Irish team rebounded in the second test in Melbourne, winning 26-21 to set up a series decider. And Wales has rocketed to third in the world after winning again in Argentina, 30 points to 12. What a stat from Josh Adams. His first test try. The game was marred though by this injury time choker hold on Puma's playmaker Nicolas Sanchez, which saw Welsh loose forward Ross Moriarty sent off. The other big loser, England, again blowing a great start to lose 23-12 to the Springboks in Bloemfontein. And there's a penalty try. 100 test prop beast in Tarawira enjoyed that as the box consigned England to a fifth straight loss, dropping them to sixth in the world rankings. And back home, four students and Dr. Glenn Deacon, Deputy Head and Senior Lecturer in Sport and Exercise Science Discipline for James Cook University in Kent, 
all arrived in Port Moresby today. The program sponsored by the Australian government under the new Colombo plan for next two weeks will see these students work and help high-performance sport PNG to evaluate and identify raw talents. Godwin Eki reports. These students in the next two weeks will work with High Performance Sport to promote the Talent ID program with various schools and communities. Areas they will look at to identify future talents are strength and conditioning, nutrition and hydration, discipline and exercise. Dr. Glenn Deacon says the athletes are here in the country to not only work with High Performance Sport PNG, but also to immerse in the culture and learn how the program is being carried out in PNG. And what they're going to do is be here for two weeks based inside the high performance sport program to see how the athletes inside PNG sports program are being trained so they can get the experience that they then can take back to Australia saying okay apart from being in the gyms and so forth back home they can say okay well apart from that now we can see what's done elsewhere in the Pacific in terms of how people, athletes are trained at different levels. The students are hoping to work with national teams to observe and assist where they can. We are here to work with your athletes. Uh, it's a very exciting opportunity for myself. I've never been here before. I'm really um, looking forward to gaining lots of experience and working with your athletes here. I think that it would be great to really take in your culture, learn how um, your approach is to exercise and the uh, sports science department um, and how you guys run things really immerse ourselves in the culture and help out the, the sporting teams of Papua New Guinea uh, with strength and conditioning as well as the, the staff members and program uh, higher-ups as well. And we work with their uh, strength and conditioning and talent identification. Um, throughout this program I really hope that I get to immerse myself in the culture and find uh, new aspects and get like a new point of view on what I hope to gain in my career in the future and hopefully bring some of those skills back over to Australia. An official welcome ceremony for the students and the professor will be held tomorrow at the Turama Aquatic Centre. Special guest at the event will be Vice Sports Minister Wesley Raminai, CEO of PNG Sports Foundation Peter Tsimalili Jr. and officials from the Australian High Commission. Godwin Eki, National MTV Sports. And that ends Shukai Sports. The weather details coming up next. Shukai Sports. Shukai Sports. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux. Celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. Looking at the weather forecast in the southern region, although cloudy, fine weather in Port Moresby and Daru. Shower or two in Kerama, fine although cloudy in Alatau and Popandita. In the Momase region in Lei, mostly fine weather in Wau as well. In Medang, fine although cloudy, same for Wewak and Vanimore. In the New Guinea Islands region, fine although cloudy in Loinga. Showers in Kaviang with a top temperature of 30. In Kokopo and Ribal, a shower or two. And in Kimbe, shower or two. And showers in Buka. And in the Highlands region, fine although cloudy in Mount Hagen, Goroka, Kundiawa, Mendi and Wabeg. The weather details were proudly brought to you by Dulux. Celebrating 50 years in PNG and the only paint made in PNG. And that's been the news, sports and weather for Sunday the 17th of June 2018. On behalf of the news team, pleasant viewing and good night.